So in our last example, we saw that we could take input and we had this nice way of being able to check to see if the input fails. Now, based on this idea, it's very helpful for us to now get an understanding of if statements, which will allow us to make different decisions based on if something is true or false. And in turn, that would allow us to say something like if the input were to fail, do something. Otherwise, if the input succeeds, do something different, right? So let's take a look at how if statements are generally going to work. And the way that we'll start this is just by discussing a little bit about comparisons. A comparison in C++ or in any language really is something that can be either true or false. So for example, our cn.fail is going to be either a zero or a one. In this example, a zero would indicate false and a one would be true. So that evaluates to either true or false, either they're failed or it didn't, right? So this would be an example of something that could be either true or false. Now, there's some more traditional examples, like I could take that val variable and I could compare it to something using, you know, some different comparisons. So for instance, two equal signs would check if it is equal to something. So if val is equal to three, for instance. To check if something isn't equal, we would do exclamation mark equals, does not equals. And then you have all your other traditional comparisons, you know, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. So these are the main ones that we would typically look at. Now what an if statement does is it takes a look at a condition and checks to see if it is true or false. We say if, and then in brackets, we put subserve condition. So for instance, if we wanted to check to see if the input succeeded or not, what we would do is we would say if standard cin.fail. Now this is all we actually have to do in order to get this to work. We can add in a condition like equals equals zero. However, when we have a function that returns either a zero or a one, C++ will interpret this as a boolean. So it will automatically convert the zero to false and the one to true, and it will be able to use that for the condition. So it's really up to you which one you would like to use. There's not really a wrong answer here. I just prefer to exempt the equality check because it's not required. What will happen with this is inside of these brace brackets, we'll get the code that happens if this cn fails. So if the condition is true, so if cn fails, what would we like to do? And in this example, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to print out something like this, input was invalid, okay? So we can just do something like that. Now, what we could do is we could say, maybe we want to do something if the input does not fail. To do that, we can use what's called an else. And else is what's going to happen in the alternative case. So say that this condition is not true. So the CN does not fail. Then we will come into this else and we will do what's inside of this else between the two brace brackets. So for example, I could print out something to say input was valid, right? I could even just, you know, print out the output, right? So we could do that as well. So that's an example of how we can use this if statement. So remember, it's going to check to see if this first condition is true. If it is, it will come into this branch here. If it's not, it goes to the else here. So it skips over this and it goes to the else instead. Let's run this code and see how this actually works, okay? So we compile it, we run it, it says give us an integer. If I put in a valid integer, it says the input was valid and prints the integer. If I put in an invalid integer, it says the input was invalid. So you see how it branches based on if the condition was true or false. Now there are a few other conditionals that do exist instead of C++. One additional one that's helpful is the else if. So we can actually check a second condition here. So we don't necessarily just have to say else just in general if the second condition isn't true. We could also do an else if. So we could check another condition on the condition that the first one fails. So basically, if this one fails, we could check a second condition to see something else, right? And where this comes in most handy is in a situation like, uh, like this. So say that the input was valid. Then we want to determine if the input was uh, positive, negative, or zero as a simple example. What I could do is I could say, well, if the val is greater than zero, then what we would say is that it is a uh, positive number, right? Now, if it isn't greater than zero, well, it could be less than zero, but it could also be zero, right? So you have to check a second condition. We can't necessarily assume that it's one or the other. So what we do is we say else if, so if this fails, we're going to come down to this condition and check this one now. 
So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say, well, if the value is less than zero, then what I could do is I could go ahead and print out, you know, negative number as an example. And then finally, when we reach here, if it's not a positive number and it's not a negative number, well, it must be zero. So I could just use a general else. So basically, if this first condition fails, it will come to the second condition and check it. If this condition also fails, it will come to this else statement and do whatever I write in here. So in this case, I would say, well, the value is zero. So number is zero, just like that. So that gives us a way of being able to check a variety of different conditions, right? So you can see that sort of process running here. So that's the idea of the else if and else statements. Now, one final type of condition that we do have available to us is a switch statement. A switch statement is going to be a helpful way of being able to check a value against a whole bunch of other values to see if it matches one of the particular cases that exists. So as an example, suppose that we were inputting a value that has like a limited number of possibilities. So maybe it could be anything from like zero to five. Well, one way that we could do that is we could say, you know, if the value is equal to zero, we do something, and then we could say else if the value is equal to one, we do something else, and then two, three, four. And that takes a lot of time to write out. So I'm not really so interested in doing something like that. Instead, what I would do is I would use what's called a switch statement. A switch statement takes in a value, so in this case, val, and then it has a bunch of different cases of what val could be and what action we want to take based on it. So for instance, I could say case zero, and I could, you know, do something with that. You know, just like as an example, I could be like uh, value is zero, right? You know, just as like a really basic example. And then what I could do is I could continue to write different conditions underneath this. So in the case that the value is one, I'll do something. In the case that the value is two, I'll do something, right? And so on and so forth like this. Now there's one other additional detail that we need to add inside of here, and it's called a break. What a break does is it removes us from the switch statement. So what this was basically doing is it's saying, so if the value that was provided is zero, it goes into here and it prints this value, and then it breaks, which means that it jumps out of this switch statement and continues executing. If we didn't have this break here, what would happen is it would fall through into the other cases, and then we just execute everything. So that wouldn't be too helpful for us. So just to continue on this, we'll just say that our possible values are zero, one, and two. So we could go like this, and we could say the value is one, and then we could go to this, and we could say the value is two, right? So that gives us uh, an example of a switch statement. Now what you could do here is you could have like an if statement to say if the value is you know less than or equal to two, then it could go to the switch state, but otherwise it's an invalid input, right? And that's a way of like combining different conditionals together, right? So you know that's something that we could do to sort of add to this code, but just for this example, this works fine for us. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and try to compile this and we'll just take a look at this example. If I enter it something like two, do you see that I get that value? If I enter one, I get that value. If I enter zero, I get that value, right? So you can see generally how that switch statement is working for us. The one final detail for switch statements is that we have what's called a default case. A default case happens if none of the cases are met, right? So what I was saying before where I was like, uh, you could have an if statement to check to see if you know the value is less than or equal to two to make sure it's like valid for this or greater than zero, right? We could also just have a default case. The default case handles all of the situations where we didn't have a valid value. So it wasn't zero, it wasn't one, it wasn't two. We're going straight to this default case here, right? So that's an example of what we could do with that. So when I do this, you'll see that if I enter something like 10, because the value is invalid, right? So it is actually executing this default case here. So this gives you an idea of how switch statements work. So switch statements are just a cleaner way of writing this kind of equality-based logic. It's also faster generally than if statements are. So if you can write a switch statement, it's usually best to do so. Otherwise, you can use if statements for those types of processes. And that gives you a good overview of the way that conditionals, decision statements, and switch statements work inside of C++. So thanks so much for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.